Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back from the break. My name is uh, Doug Brenny, and I'm a laboratory animal veterinarian uh, currently working at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. Uh, we're going to now move into uh, session six, where we're going to cover some of the emerging topics and recommended updates to the guide that the, com that the uh, standing committee heard from our stakeholder community. Uh, next slide, please. So there were a number of emerging topics highlighted to the standing committee during the multiple stakeholder listening sessions, including considerations of the animal care and research staff's health and well-being, uh, particularly uh, with emphasis in the area of compassion fatigue. Um, there was a expressed the lack of guidance provided regarding the use of pets or client-owned animals as research subjects and the current use of sanctuaries and adoption efforts for animals no longer being utilized in re for research purposes. There were a number of other emerging topics, including vivarium energy conservation, the inclusion of wildlife and cephalopods, One Health initiatives, and the growing uh, international application of the guide as a research document. But many of these uh, later topics will or already have been addressed in other sessions of uh, this workshop. Uh, next slide, please. There were, there were a relatively large number of comments from the listening sessions that related to personnel support by way of occupational health programs in general. And the views expressed regarding occupational health vary drastically depending on the respondents. Uh, some relayed that the occupational health program should be considered beyond the scope of the guide and the responsibility should be assumed by either the institution or some of the regulatory entities and not even be the purview of the ICUC. And others stated that occupational health section should and the guide should be much more robust, including providing guidance and granular detail on things like maximum exposure limits for hazards such as allergens, and providing guidance and standardization of PPE or personal protective equipment. And next slide, please. Of those considerations for personnel support, uh, the subject of compassion fatigue was mentioned often as it has been during this workshop as well. Uh, these bullets represent direct statements uh, provided to the standing committee. And almost all that addressed this issue were supportive of either highlighting the topic in the guide or at least providing uh, reference to evidence-based studies uh, as guidance on the subject. Uh, next slide. Uh, stakeholder communities uh, comments regarding animal retirement and, and adoption were generally positive on the subject. But there were uh, numerous concerns elevated regarding the lack of established standards and oversights of sanctuaries, especially those utilized to house non retired non human primates. Uh, many of the respondents felt that it was more appropriate to consider reuse uh, prior to retirement or preferred to see efforts such as uh, more focused uh, uh, efforts on robust aging programs as an alternative to retirement. Uh, those that were more uh, broadly supportive of adoption for other species beyond NHPs really felt that the guide should promote adoption in general and retirement by providing direct guidance or pointing towards, again, relevant reference materials designed to help buy cooks and institu institutions with this effort. Next slide, please. This is... So multiple respondents from the listening session pointed to the lack of information and direction in the current version of the guide regarding the use of pets and client-owned animals in biomedical and clinical research. Uh, these recommendations range from simply stating that if, if they're not going to be covered by the guide, that the guide really just basically state that. And it, or it ranged with that to end up providing very specific information on space requirements, informed consent, and guidance on overnight stays of pets uh, utilized in research projects. Stakeholders suggested adding minimum standards for client-owned animals, such as veterinary uh, version of informed consent for owners to understand the risks, as well as the benefits to their animals for the work that was uh, going to happen in the research field. And others felt for federally funded or privately funded research on client animals, the guide should provide clarification of the role and responsibilities for the high cook. So with that brief introduction, I will turn uh, it over to our first invited guest speaker in this session, uh, Dr. Laura Kanye. Kanye. Thanks, Doug. Good afternoon, everybody. I wanna thank the committee for inviting me to talk to all of you uh, this afternoon and good evening and good very early morning for some of our international attendees. 
I want to talk today a little bit on the issue of what a lot of folks are starting to refer to as the fourth R. Next slide, please. And that's retirement, rehoming, and release. And, and I'll just touch on release a little bit at the end of uh, my period today. Um, but primarily, all of this focuses on options for animal research subjects beyond euthanasia. And so retirement and rehoming or adoption hasn't, you know, has been around for a long time. Interestingly enough, uh, 1996 was the earliest reference in the literature um, regarding adoption of lab animals. The earliest documented adoption was in 1993 at Johns Hopkins Universities. And then in early 2000s, we saw a shift where primate sanctuaries had historically provided uh, retirement for, for non-human primates that were part of the exotic pet trade, um, we started to see a shift to providing retirement for um, NHPs from research. Next slide, please. So just briefly on institutional involvement, when you're looking at setting up and establishing a retirement and rehoming program, uh, there's a number of people that need to be involved in this at the onset. Uh, of course, your IACUC, general counsel as it relates to transfer agreements and non-disclosure agreements, your institutional administration, because you are often looking for funding as well, communications and public relations. You know, not only does retirement and rehoming uh, go a, a substantive way to helping to relieve compassion fatigue in a lot of our our um, lab animal workers, but it also can be kind of a bright spot in terms of um, an opportunity for some good PR. Animal care, vet care, and then often forgotten is the PI and lab. And um, these are individuals who've worked really closely with those animals and often um, love to be involved in retirement and adoption efforts. Next slide, please. Program funding. There's a number of models that are out there. It's amazing if you have institutional support. Um, PIs will occasionally drive this too and actually initiate the conversation. There have been situations where personal or private foundation donations have been received to retire or provide funding for adoption, um, as well as fundraising. It is important to note that at this time, retirement and adoption cannot be funded by federal grant monies. Interestingly enough, anecdotally, um, I heard of one uh, instance recently where uh, a, a PI who was uh, submitted a grant for NHP neuroscience work actually mentioned the disposition of retirement in her grant application, and she got some comments back in terms of how she would uh, ensure the care of those animals after the fact. So it seems like it is being um, gathering a lot more attention these days. Next slide, please. So plan and process, obviously you need a formal written policy about adoption and retirement. Um, you also really need to have a detailed process for screening process for potential adopters and for sanctuaries that you might use. And I'm gonna do kind of take an approach for commonalities on these two efforts, but also kind of separate out sanctuaries as we go along. And you also, it is recommended that maybe you have some SOPs or some guidelines for preparation of those animals before you transfer them to a new family or to a sanctuary for retirement. Next slide, please. Anticipated costs. Um, if you're retiring to a sanctuary, sanctuary whether it's um, an agricultural animal or a non-human primate, those costs are gonna involve lifetime care of that animal. Um, there's going to be costs for animal preparations in terms of vaccinations, diagnostics, serology, um, and then shipping uh, containers as well as transportation costs. Oftentimes you'll see that the animal care costs for the time that those animals uh, remain in your facility uh, while they're being prepared um, and the veterinary cost for spay neuter um, are often just assumed. So next slide, please. Regulations and policies. So in 2019, historically, the FDA did uh, publish a statement saying that they would permit certain research animals to be retired and adopted. And that was a, a significant shift from their previous um, stance where any animal that had been exposed to uh, compounds or drugs that were not yet 
um, approved for use in for veterinary use or human use, those animals could not be adopted or retired. And then they did a shift on that in 2019, end of 2019. But more importantly today, which has gathered a lot of um, concern and attention, is that many of these states are starting to implement legislation for mandatory adoption laws by state. Minnesota was the first state to implement a mandatory adoption law in 2014. There are a number of states that currently either have legislation approved or legislation that has been proposed um, for mandatory adoption. Uh, and, and if you're dealing with that within your state, I would highly suggest that some involvement on that. The AVMA policy is that an attending vet or their designee is the individual who should be determining if those animals are fit for adoption um, and releasing them for adoption. You also don't want to find yourself in a situation where those animals are first stopping at a shelter that may not have been vetted by the institution. Next slide, please. There are a number of polished, published policies out there for support for adoption of research animals and retirement. I just listed a few of them here. Um, when I did a search for these, uh, all of these published policies, pretty much every professional organization that has a high degree of um, animal use for research uh, has a position statement. Next slide, please. Eligibility of an animal. So, so when I caution you about state laws that may require all animals to be adopted, dogs and cats especially, or NHPs to be retirement, um, a lot of times that legislation is is all encompassing and doesn't really take into consideration that an animal may, may not be an eligible candidate for adoption or for retirement. And so, as you can imagine, that animal should be in good health. It should have acceptable behavior. And you also need to be aware of the research history of that animal because um, exposure to certain infectious agents or drugs may render that animal ineligible for adoption or retirement. And then also, if there's been any type of genetic manipulation, the recombinant DNA guidelines prevent that animal from being released to the public. Next slide, please. Some species considerations for adoption. Um, one of the things that I would highly recommend if you're uh, looking at adopting out some of the more non-traditional species is always check to see if that species is legal to own as a pet in that state. Um, at Princeton University, we have um, a sugar glider, glider breeding colony at Princeton, um, and uh, we're very close to Pennsylvania, and it is actually illegal to own sugar gliders as pets in the state of Pennsylvania. So you need to make sure you are aware of state law. Additionally, if you're looking at retiring ag species or adopting out ag species, you also need to be aware of local zoning ordinances based on where that residence is. Obviously, other things you're going to look at is compatibility of that animal with other pets in the household, with children. Um, and then if you are looking at retiring ag species or adopting out ag species, you do need to ensure that those animals are being retired and not intended for other use. Next slide, please. So just some brief considerations. Um, when you're looking at uh, adopting out a, a laboratory animal or sending it for foster prior to adoption, um, you do need to ensure the responsibility of future veterinary care. You need to ensure that legally ownership of that animal is being transferred, that there's a plan to, for transition to home environment, and that there is a communication plan. And I'll, I'll give some more details about the communication here in a couple of seconds. Next slide, please. Applicant screening adoption interest, experience, everything that you would be facing if you were interested in adopting a shelter animal. Um, so very common sense approach to this. Next slide, please. Preparation for adoption. At Princeton, our attitude is, is that we want to give that, we want to adopt out or retire the most healthiest animal we can. Um, so there is an obligation to spay neuter that animal. In the case of our non-human primates, we vasectomize our males vaccinating that animal um, prior to adoption into the home or retirement in a sanctuary. And it is um, good to be aware of what the challenges are with outdoor housing at a non-human primate sanctuary based on where that sanctuary is located as well. Um, often for non-human primates, you're vaccinating them for tetanus, maybe rabies, um, 
And, and depending on the area, there may be other items to consider. Prophylactic care, we have a tendency to send our um, adopted animals home with kind of a starter kit is the way we think of that. Um, as well as any laboratory diagnostics, we also try to have uh, do some dental prophylaxis before we send those animals on. And then the other thing you want to do is do a really good review of medical and behavior records review. You don't want to release those records necessarily without some redaction. What I would recommend is actually summarizing those records um, for either the adopter um, or the sanctuary. Next slide, please. So some just a, a few considerations for sanctuary it is really important to look at what the sanctuary's position on the use of animals in research. Um, it's been recommended in the literature through the years that you avoid those sanctuaries that discuss rescuing animals, research animals. Um, I would recommend focusing on a sanctuary for a long-term relationship between the institution and the sanctuary. And then things that are very obvious in terms of do they have space available and what is the timing of that availability? What is their management structure and oversight? If they're nonprofit, do they have a board of directors? Um, what's their financial stability? And what is their financial stability for the future? And then staffing. Uh, one of the things that I think it's important to look at, especially as it relates to non-human primates, is, is animal care being taken care of by volunteers or by paid employees? Next slide, please. You also want to look at what if they're registered as a 501c3. Sanctuaries also have accreditations. Um, the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries and North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance, NAPSA actually has very detailed requirements for membership in that that relates to the prohibition on exhibiting those animals and providing access to the public. And then you should also check on the regulatory registration, um, especially as it relates to USDA covered species. Next slide, please. As you start the conversation, I would recommend a non-disclosure agreement. You wanna be very careful and be very clear on how the institution's name may or may not be used and if permissions are required. Um, and you also wanna talk about a communication plan in that you would like an update on the animal after it arrives, after it's had an opportunity to acclimate to the sanctuary environment as well as any significant events such as natural disasters that might occur. Next slide, please. Veterinary care plan, standard practices for acclimation, quarantine, and social housing, especially as it relates to non-human primates. A euthanasia plan. So that's something that we'll often forget, um, that in the, in, in the event of an animal that's become very geriatric and is starting to experience quality of life issues, do they have a plan in place to evaluate quality of life and to provide for the humane euthanasia of that animal? Um, and also what their euthanasia plans would be in the face of an, a disaster. Next slide, please. I would also suggest you ask for references. Um, you conduct an interview with management and as well as the veterinarian that provides vet care. And I would also really highly recommend a site visit. Next slide, please. Paperwork, briefly. We've talked about summary of health records and behavior records. For our non-human primates, when we retire them, we also send a, a list of their preferences in terms of treats, produce, food, any allergies they might have. Transfer agreement. So you should have a transfer agreement, an institutional agreement with that sanctuary or that adopter for every single animal. And then if you're transferring a USDA covered species, you, you do need to do the USDA form 7020 for dis final disposition of that animal. We've discussed NDA and then um, transportation paperwork that may be required for animals crossing state lines if they are USDA covered species as well. Um, you're gonna need health certificates. Next slide, please. Transportation, if you're going by ground, um, versus air, don't forget that there are IATA requirements for air transport. One of the things too, if you're um, retiring ag species or non-human primates and those sanctuaries have outdoor housing, what is the environmental temperature gonna be at the destination? Um, you don't wanna take an animal that's been housed in indoor enclosures for a good portion of their life and then um, acclimate them to outdoor housing in the middle of the dog days of summer. Next slide, please. Unexpected problems. I would always recommend that you have conversations about this within your institution. It's better to be prepared and have discussed it 
What are you going to do if a doctor wants to surrender the animal? Um, do you want to be notified upon death of the animal, any adverse event, such as potentially escape that involves the animal, disaster event, closure of the sanctuary or foster organization? Um, I have heard some, some distressing stories about how uh, when institutions went to periodically check on the animals that they retired, that that sanctuary had um, closed their door. And if maybe ownership of that sanctuary has changed so, such that there's an anti-research sentiment now. Next slide, please. So just, uh, just to kind of cap off my portion of this session, um, one of the things that doesn't get a lot of attention that I think is worth discussing is release of certain wildlife species back into the environment. At Princeton, we've had an opportunity to do this with some, some native species to New Jersey. Um, and I would say you have to be very cautious when you do this um, in terms of does that animal have the ability to survive and compete for resources in the environment? Is there gonna be an impact on environment or other species? And then of course you need IACUC approval for that in terms of um, disposition of the animal, but also I would really caution that you need to be touching base with your local state and federal agencies, US Fish and Wildlife, state Fish and Wildlife, state environmental management. I would also recommend probably just uh, contacting the state veterinarian as well. Next slide, please. So that's what I have for today. I do have some references at the end um, and I know we have time for questions a little bit later on. So thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Conyer. Um, next up here, we have Dr. Sally Thompson Iratani. Great, um, thank you. And just to make sure everyone can hear me okay, I assume you'll let me know if there's any trouble with that. Um, I am really excited to, to be here all today. I got lunch before 9 a.m. So that's an awesome day to start because we are out here on the West Coast. So um, my name is Sally thompson Iratani. I am at the University of Washington. I serve as the Assistant Vice Provost for our Animal Care Outreach and Three R's program. I know that's quite a mouthful. Um, I am also a faculty member in our Center for One Health Research. And um, I really do want to thank everyone for inviting me here today to present on occupational health and safety portion of the guide, um, specifically, you know, in regard to protecting the workers who are involved with research where we use animals. And I want to emphasize that this includes workers that have daily interaction with the animals and those that have very infrequent interactions with the animals. We really need to do a risk-based approach and keep all of these factors in consideration when we are looking at a program. Um, next slide, please. Um, the standard disclaimer, <laughs> the views expressed are my own with consultation and input from an amazing group of colleagues. Um, I did notice that many of us have relied on crowdsourcing for our presentations. I really just want to give a shout out. I think this is a testament to the collaborative nature of our community and our efforts to ensure we were representing multiple voices in our conversations going forward as we try to inform the guide. Um, next slide, please. So to start off, um, the guide currently, what does it say about occupational health and safety? And I think also referring back to what should it say, and we can have a little bit of conversation about that, but currently in chapter two, under the animal care and use program, it says that a um, animal care and use program must have an occupational health and safety program, and it must be consistent with federal, state, and local regulations, and it should focus on maintaining a self and safe and healthy workplace. So I would actually change that should particularly to a must, but um, this is what it currently says. Um, next slide, please. So it is broken down into multiple sections. And actually um, my personal opinion is that it does a pretty good job of explaining why each of these sections are important. Um, I think going into more detail in the guide itself um, wouldn't make a lot of sense, but I think making sure that there is access to ancillary information on all of these topics would be really important. Um, it covers control and prevention strategies, which are strategies to prevent occupational health hazards. 
hazard ID and risk assessment. How do we ID the hazards and do a thorough risk assessment to ensure that we are prepared? Facilities, equipment, and monitoring to ensure proper engineering controls and prevent hazard exposure. Obviously, personnel training, how people should be trained on hazard exposure and how to protect themselves. Personal hygiene, I found that an interesting one, but just the importance of personal hygiene for maintaining a healthy workplace. Um, animal experimentation involving hazards. We need to be able to ID the hazards that are associated with the experimental protocol itself and how to manage and minimize exposure. Personal protection. There's many different types of personal protective equipment um, required, and we need to understand the biosafety levels and the individual uh, susceptibilities of an individual in order to make sure we're providing the proper personal protection. And in order to do all of this, we really need to have a medical evaluation and a preventive medicine program in place. And this ideally would involve pre-employment, health assessment, and exposure assessment. So we're doing before, during, and then if there happens to be an exposure. So um, next slide, please. So I do think that, sorry, uh, you went forward two slides, if you can go back one. Um, thank you. Um, so there definitely is an opportunity to make sure that all the references in regards to these sections are up to date and possibly add some recent examples, particularly like from our recent experience with COVID outbreak and some things like that. But I really, again, in my personal opinion, I think getting too specific in the guide might be a lot of detail that would could be changing fairly rapidly. So it might be better to rely on these resources outside of the guide. Um, and now if we can go to next slide, please. So I also wanted to briefly talk about some other sections of note that I think deserve some attention. They're not specifically under the heading of occupational health and safety. They are in chapter two under the animal care and use program, but I do think that they actually have some influence on the occupational health and safety of our employees. These include personnel security, and investigating and reporting animal welfare concerns. Next slide, please. So currently under personnel security, it says a program should take into account criminal activities such as personnel harassment and assault, facility trespassing, arson, and vandalism, which pose threats to laboratory animals, research personnel, equipment and facilities, and they pose a threat to the biomedical research at the organization. Many people live in constant fear of harassment for doing their jobs. And I think this needs to be taken into consideration. Next slide, please. There's also this, we have a very clear clause in, in the guide and in everything that we work about investigating and reporting animal welfare concerns. And the guide says the institution must develop methods for reporting and investigating animal welfare concerns. There needs to be training and regular communication. Also, it mentions that training and regular communication about the science and the animal care program can help reduce concerns that we be, would be submitted via these mechanisms. So I think this is really about openness and communication. Next slide, please. So this gets to what I would call psychological safety psychological, occupational health and safety, many people involved in our profession often live in fear of becoming targets of groups opposed to research involving animals, and they live in fear of reporting concerns and being retaliated against. These living in a constant state of fear, I think we all know is not good for people or the animals. So it's something that we really need to think about as we're developing our programs. Next slide, please. So I look at this, you know, based on what is currently in the guide with harassment and retaliation, we should be able to think about a component of mental health and safety in our occupational health and safety programs that we should be adding in. Next slide, please. So what's not covered? What's not covered is human animal bond, what to do when we become attached to an animal the emotional involvement in the success of the science and with the animals, we become emotionally involved in both the success of the science and in with, with the animals themselves. The stress of witnessing pain or distress and quite honestly, what's not covered too is how do we cope with an adverse event? 
It can be very trying. It can be very challenging to cope with when something doesn't go right. Now, this is going to be covered in large in the next talk, so I am not going to go into detail, but there are a lot of ways to support people, and this should also be part of an occupational health and safety program. But again, this you'll be able to look forward to a lot more conversation, particularly about compassion fatigue in the following talk. Next slide, please. So I wanted to mention one way that we can continue to support occupational health of people in our community is through training and helping people understand what this looks like. So originally, I will say they were trying to get Dr. Peter Rabinowitz um, from the University of Washington to do this talk, but he unfortunately had a conflict, so you got me. Um, but we do have a program at the University of Washington that I think he would have mentioned, and that is specifically focused on occupational health at the human-animal interface. And this includes training for physicians, veterinarians, and researchers to develop competencies to provide occupational health services to workers in research facilities, veterinary clinics, zoos, and agricultural settings. And it is based on a One Health approach um, to our health programs of the people and the animals in these environments. So I think one of the elements of this, which may be useful going forward, is it does address animals in a research setting but also in the wildlife settings. And I just want to give a shout out to my colleague, um, Rita Belanca, who is currently doing a master's degree in this program and a project and a project focused on compassion fatigue and addressing the human animal bond. And I just wanted to show um, the recent shout out to her on this page also. Um, next slide, please. So, what does this look like when we pull everything together? Um, I think I lost count over yesterday and today on how many times I heard reference to a culture of care. So there are many different definitions and interpretations for a culture of care. This is not meant to be all inclusive. And I actually had an updated slide that doesn't look like it got incorporated here. So I apologize for that, but I will make sure the updated slides are sent out. But what I included here, you know, a culture of care is a robust part of the occupational health and safety program because it can help in creating a psychologically and safe environment for people. And as I mentioned, there are many models to this, but there needs to be a strong scientific foundation. We need to understand the science. We need to understand what we're supporting so that we can take the best care of the animals. We need a commitment to animal welfare. We also need a commitment to human welfare. So I want to emphasize that's Animal welfare includes both the, um, both the research animals and the humans that are taking care of them. An emphasis on the three R's. So even if you find them controversial, I really appreciated um, Dr. Turner's presentation this morning on the three R's. I think she did a fantastic job of addressing how important they are. And maybe it's a reinterpretation that we need to be doing, but they really have, um, they do are accepted within our community. And a lot of us have relied on them for our communications. We need openness and communication to help people feel safe. We need to be able to talk about our work. We need to have pride in our work. And we do this by talking and understanding the science and supporting the animals. And then we can talk about all the work that important work that we're doing. But additionally, we need buy-in at all levels within our organization. From the top to the bottom, we need buy-in. Everybody needs to understand how important this is. Next slide, please. So interestingly, we've been having a lot of talks over the last couple of days about who's responsible. Who's responsible for making this happen? And um, yes. minute warning. thank you very much. Um, the burden we're placing on different groups within our animal care programs, the IACUC members may be feeling like they're taking on responsibilities that are out of scope and outside their area of expertise. That puts a lot of burden on everyone. Um, so who is responsible? Well, um, next slide, please. I would venture to say that it is an organizational responsibility and where exactly it resides within the organization depends on the size and complexity of the organization. Ultimate responsibility may rest with the institutional official. I heard great conversation about the role of the institutional official yesterday. Um, you can see the current definition for the institutional official on this slide. But ultimate responsibility for a culture of care may rest with the I.O. to ensure that the organization understands the importance of that in the overall context. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
No, just a, a, in my final thing, I would like to emphasize, you know, to finish off, um, can we push this one step further? And I heard this from, particularly from some speakers this morning and from some speakers yesterday. Are we ready to push this one step further, ultimate responsibility and consider what the guide needs to look like going forward and embrace what actually I would say taking, moving forward to a culture of challenge. Um, I personally love this picture of this rat looking at themselves in the camera and determining whether it likes what it sees. Um, and in my mind, a culture of challenge looks like this, looking for the acceptable rather than choosing the accepted, challenging the way we have always done things so we can move forward and support strong sound science and animal welfare. And my final slide, please. I was okay with that. I'm done with my presentation. I did just want to give a shout out. I really appreciated hearing about some of the non-aversive handling that was referred to yesterday and this morning. And I wanted to share this adorable picture of a mouse peeking out of their tunnel. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, next here we have Dr. Patrick Lester and Dr. Tara Martin. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Tara Martin, and you'll hear from Patrick Lester in just a couple minutes. Um, we'll be talking about the emerging issue of compassion fatigue and how that relates to the guide. I think all this discussion of culture of care and the previous discussion um, were, were great intros to us, so we're really excited. Uh, we're both at the University of Michigan, where we help direct our compassion satisfaction program, and we've both performed some research on this topic, both independently here and in partnership with the 3RC. Uh, basically, I'll give you guys some background on the topic, and then Dr. Lester will come in at the end with our specific recommendations. Uh, next slide. Oh, you guys can just add the, the word, click a couple times to get the words onto the slide. Um, so there have been numerous publications since the previous edition of the guide that address the costs of compassion within the laboratory animal care in wider related fields, such as the veterinary field. And to best understand this information, you should have some understanding of um, a few important terms and concepts. And the first is that all of us who work in caring professions and other professions, nursing, veterinary medicine, um, any animal care, experience burdens associated with providing that care. Compassion stress is that feeling of burden that's caused by relieving the suffering of others. And when you experience that repeatedly or really intensely, it can lead to compassion fatigue. Um, there are some other terms kind of emerging in the literature for this, uh, but we're gonna focus on compassion fatigue here because it's the most well known. And that can be defined as this feeling of physical, emotional, and psychological depletion, um, in this case, associated with working and caring for research animals. Um, Compassion fatigue is, you know, kind of normal and expected in our profession. It waxes and wanes over time, and you can kind of think of it as being composed of a couple of factors, which are burnout and secondary traumatic stress. Next slide, please. Uh, and next slide. So, um, Burnout is related to this long-term or repeated exhausting stress associated with work. And you can feel that independently of compassion fatigue and it can contribute to compassion fatigue. Uh, this image shows sort of a cycle of burnout in veterinary staff, but the information is applicable to uh, laboratory animal care staff and researchers as well. And um, when exposed to a difficult work in, working environment, often staff will really rise to the occasion and work really hard to get through that difficult time. That means they have less energy and less time to devote to anything like self-care or family obligations, all the things that make our life enriching or that get us through the day. Um, and then what we'll do in that situation is in many cases sort of revise our value system to further prioritize work because it becomes what's most important and necessary in a given moment. Uh, those work stressors can continue to pile up and staff eventually can become so burnt out that they end up withdrawn and experiencing feelings such as depersonalization or feelings of emptiness, um, which can lead to depression and burnout. And I think a key piece of knowledge to take away here is that while um, underlying mental health issues or personal poor coping skills certainly contribute to burnout and compassion fatigue, our workers actually often exhibit really high levels of resilience and good coping mechanisms, which is overwhelming them. 
uh, and wearing them down past that already elevated ability to cope. And this is especially true in the face of the staffing challenges that were addressed yesterday that many of us have felt in recent years. Uh, next slide. So secondary traumatic stress is another component here. This is the feeling of distress that's associated with experiencing or learning about the stress of others, including the animals that we care for. Next slide. Um, two other factors or contributors to compassion fatigue are these feelings of moral stress or conflict, and then um, this imbalance between effort and reward, which we'll talk about next. So moral stress may, may also be called moral distress or moral conflict. And essentially that's when you feel like you know what is the right thing to do based on your own internal ethics or wider professional norms, but you're unable to do that thing because of some external factor. And one example of this that comes up frequently in our field is what's called the caring harming or caring killing paradox, which has been described uh, for research animal care workers and also in the veterinary and agricultural care fields. And this is the moral conflict that occurs when you have this satisfaction from providing great care for the animals you're working with, butting up against the distress that you feel uh, when you have to harm or kill those animals. Next slide. And then effort reward imbalance is when the effort you put in at work doesn't line up with the rewards you receive. And I think it's pretty obvious how that would contribute to feelings of being burnt out. Next slide. So there are lots of um, particular contributors to compassion fatigue within our field. And um, secondary traumatic stress, of course, as we just discussed, can be associated with witnessing or causing harm to animals. Uh, at the end of most studies, animals are euthanized or die. We try to adopt them out or rehome them when we can, but that's usually not the case. Um, at the same time, staff feel attached to those animals under their care or that they're using in their research, and this leads to that caring, killing paradox we just discussed. Social support is a really crucial mitigating factor for compassion fatigue in our field and others, but because animal research is so controversial, this contributes to feelings of misrepresentation and social stigma among workers, which makes it really hard for people to access that support. You know, they just don't feel like they can talk about their work to others. They don't feel like the public supports them. This came out in the COVID-19 pandemic when there were all these, you know, signs up about, you know, supporting essential workers. Our staff in surveys felt less supported. Um, finally, uh, the typical challenges associated with any workplace are also felt in our field. So the environments can be really fast paced. There's just a lot to do each day. Um, sometimes leadership has poor communication for, you know, a variety of reasons or staff feel undervalued. And when our staff have those staffing challenges, it adds to this cumulative stress that they're feeling, you know, from the more particular natures of animal research itself, leading to um, pretty heavy feelings of burnout or compassion fatigue. Next slide. And this slide just further summarizes some recent literature that identifies these key factors. I've kind of broken them into some human factors, animal related factors, and euthanasia related factors specifically. Um, but, uh, and I have a long list of references. We'll provide some kind of highlighted resources at the end of this talk, but there, there's a long list that I've submitted that should be part of the proceedings after this workshop. Um, of note here, and what we didn't discuss on the previous slide, are that uh, workplace culture is a really key contributor to workplace satisfaction and compassion satisfaction or compassion fatigue. Um, lack of training, uh, exposure to animal suffering and death, feelings of inability to provide appropriate or great animal care, feeling locked out of decision making, all of those contribute to compassion fatigue for our workers in particular. Next slide. Um, and furthermore, compassion fatigue is felt by all members of our animal research community, even people who may not work directly hands-on with the animals. Uh, for animal caregivers, of course, their jobs are often intensely physical, which is just their hard jobs to do. They're on the front line working with our animals, seeing them sick, but also having really little control over decision-making ability for those animals, whether in decision-making for what we provide to those animals, you know, the types of enrichment we can give, things like that, when those animals are euthanized, who goes off and on study. Um, and then, let's see, so researchers often know that they're, they know when they're inducing pain or disease in animals as part of their study, that's stressful for them. 
Um, administrative staff and IACUC members engage in close monitoring of the whole animal activities uh, within an institution and of protocols, so they understand and have to cope with the scale of animal-based research at a given institution. And then trainers, for example, often work with a lot of animals and are working with trainees who, you know, make mistakes. Next slide. I thought this was really well summarized in this quote from Newsom in 2019. Um, Stress can be as apparent as working on death as an endpoint studies to as subtle as placing an animal order fully aware that most animals have euthanasia as study endpoints. This really encapsulates the thought that all of our workers can experience secondary traumatic stress and compassion fatigue. Next slide. Thank you. Outside of its direct effects on well-being for personnel, compassion fatigue, of course, contributes to job satisfaction and worker retention. Um, employees that experience lower burnout and lower compassion fatigue and higher compassion satisfaction tend to have higher job satisfaction. And some recent studies highlight the need for open communication from leadership and efforts to ensure staff feel valued as potential mitigating factors in compassion fatigue. You can hit that slide again. And um, I think one good thing to note here is that um, and the last talk kind of touched on this as well. When people feel more informed about their research that's going on, uh, they often understand things better and may experience less compassion fatigue. So it's not just communication from leadership about, you know, the value of workers individually and, you know, what you need to do in your day-to-day -day job. But we've found here at Michigan that it's really helpful and people really appreciate our husbandry workers, especially hearing from researchers about the purpose of the animals and why they're being used in research. It gives value to their life. Oh yeah, you can go, that's fine, thank you. Um, as in many fields, efforts to combat compassion fatigue in our own are often focused on individuals. Uh, we have a lot of information about encouraging, for example, mindfulness practices, yoga, things like that. Those are really important and can be super helpful, but compassion fatigue is an institutional issue. It's field-wide uh, and we cannot place the burden solely on individuals to cope with it. That's really unfair and inappropriate. Uh, regarding veterinary workers, but applicable to everyone, Steffi notes that emphasizing the role and burden of the individual really just distracts us from the ability to correct the fundamental sources of workplace-related stressors, such as compassion fatigue. Next slide. Here we are at two minutes. Oh, then I'll just run through this really quickly. So compassion satisfaction is the feeling of fulfillment or gratification associated with this care-related work. Um, and personnel can feel this and compassion fatigue. <laughs> So I think that's important to know they're not necessarily a continuum. You can feel satisfied and also fatigued depending on what's going on. And there's quite a few contributors that uh, add to compassion satisfaction, such as the ability to provide high quality enrichment or refined handling, um, which reduces stress in your animals, good social support, of course, positive interactions with animals, understanding the research translatability, and then um, open discussion and open communication, especially about the ethical implications of your work. And I'm going to just move uh, out of the Oh, we've got Patrick. You guys can switch over to him. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Tara, for the uh, wonderful explanation of compassion fatigue and describing all of its importance um, for that. But some of the things that we've worked at our program here, and we know that the um, evidence and the data is starting to indicate that Confession fatigue and burnout are occupational health risks. Um, this could be experienced due to the inherent nature of the work, as Tara described in, in those references and looking at that cycle. Sometimes this could be animal research-related factors or general workplace-related factors, and these all promote burnout and compassion fatigue in their own variations. Um, I think part of, um, as we'll indicate, an institutional, we'll recommend an institutional goal for this would be to try to detect or find an awareness of <laughs> compassion fatigue symptoms or triggers um, as that cycle that we indicated for where you could either reduce the components or potentially um, interrupt the cycle of um, events that are leading to compassion fatigue, um, depending on the uh, scope. Um, but we feel strongly that compassion fatigue or mental health should be included um, in an occupational health and safety program. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this should be a risk-based um, institutional approach. So the responsibility should be through the institution, but it should just be in, done in harmony with um, contributions from animal care, the occupational health team, IACUC, and relate, um, research teams. And the IACUC could serve as kind of a, a monitor on this, perhaps through semi-annual program review or quality assurance um, of with that. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, additional education and training should be um, provided through these programs um, to improve awareness, detection, and assistance in many of the um, aspects that Tara had indicated um, in earlier parts of this presentation that could be looked at. And next slide, please. And, and lastly, partnering with other professions or susceptibility to compassion fatigue. So a lot of this takes a one health approach. So we looked at things with you know, our human um, health care teams, our um, veterinary medicine, our researchers, our allied health professionals, um, and even those that are kind of in this one health um, umbrella, which would also include the importance of the human animal bond, which we heard from Dr. Thompson. Um, we feel all of these should be kind of done in harmony. A lot of us may be working at different institutions, depending on the scope. Some are paired with medical um, institutions, veterinary institutions. So I think a One Health approach could be very valuable to that. And lastly, we did, um, uh, next slide, please. We did list some references and resources. Uh, there are some um, additional ones that we have on a, that will be also be made available um, along with those lines, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, next, uh, our last presenter for this session is Dr. Kristen Weishar. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kristen Weishar. I'm a veterinary medical oncologist at Colorado State University, and I am uh, the director of our, of our oncology clinical trial service at CSU. Um, and I just wanted to thank um, the meeting organizers for inviting me to speak today. This has been uh, really interesting for me to hear um, some of the issues that you guys deal with as I don't work with laboratory animals, and um, but there are a lot of things that are quite similar um, in issues that we encounter. Next slide, please. Um, so you might be wondering why I'm here. As I said, I don't work with laboratory animals um, and I don't use the guide. I'm really not familiar with the guide. Um, in any way, it's not something that we use with our clinical patients. Um, I'm exclusively involved in clinical research using client-owned animals that have spontaneous diseases. However, um, I do have some interaction with our IACUC as our all of our study protocols have to be reviewed and approved by some, some sort of regulatory body, which is usually the IACUC. And so um, having the IACUC have information about how to review and approve and monitor um, clinical studies used in client-owned animals is an important factor and not something that is currently covered by the guide. Um, and just in general, there is a lack of content pertaining to companion, companion animal research in the guide. And it sounds like there's some interest in um, potentially including that type of information. And I think it potentially could be useful. Next slide, please. Um, so there are some similarities between research and companion animals and laboratory animals, but there's also some unique aspects specifically related to the review and approval of this type of research. So um, number one being that these are client-owned animals. So there are going to be some things, some aspects of these these patients that we aren't able to control, like their housing and their feeding and their watering, because these are things that are all done by their, their owners at home. There's also quite a bit of diversity among study participants. So these patients are going to be um, heterogeneous in their genetics. Um, there's a large variety of ages and breeds and weights and sizes. Um, and also comorbidities can happen with these patients. They can have um, current medical issues or um, be on other concomitant medications that can be variable among these participants participants. And we can limit this a little bit, you know, with our study inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, but um, it's just the, the fact of the matter is that these patients are not all going to be similar to one another. Another really important factor is informed consent, which is something that um, is really crucial and important um, to the conduct of research and companion animals, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Something else to consider is um, when reviewing a protocol is the feasibility of the procedures that are, are gonna occur during a clinical trial in a clinical setting rather than in a laboratory setting. It's also important to consider the proper use of incentives and mitigation of coercion. So when we're enrolling patients and clients into a clinical trial, making sure that the incentives are appropriate and that we are not being coercive when we're asking these owners to participate in a clinical trial. And related to that is conflict of interest. So making sure that an investigator does not have a significant conflict of interest related to the clinical trial, or if there is one present, making sure that that's disclosed so clients are aware. And some of this can be um, 
can be alleviated or improved by the implementation of a clinical review board or a veterinary clinical studies committee. So these are committees um, associated with a, with a university or institution that are comprised of people who are directly involved in clinical research and sort of have a better understanding of, of these factors that I've discussed. And really there can be, um, you know, it's a cooperation between the IACUC and the a clinical review committee when approving and reviewing research and making sure that um, you know both groups are comfortable with their research moving forward. Um, you know, at, at CSU in particular, um, a lot of our um, studies involving client-owned animals can receive an iCook exemption and have their review go solely to a clinical review board. Um, but there are certainly some um, some protocols that do require a full iACook review, whether it's a government-funded study or um, a study going for FDA approval, um, where an iCook review is required. But the clinical review board is still going to be involved, so they're going to be reviewing the consent form um, and to be able to make sure that the consent form is appropriate they also need to understand the full protocol. So there can be some back and forth and, and conversations between the IACUC and a clinical review board to make sure that all the appropriate um, pieces are covered. And there was actually recently an AVMA, AVMA policy published about the establishment and use of veterinary clinical study committees that um, you know sort of defines what this committee, what sort of people should be on this committee, committee what their roles are, what sort of regulations there should be. So there is some guidance um, to that effect out there uh, being published. Uh, next slide, please. So like I mentioned, informed consent is really crucial to um, clinical studies involving companion animals. Um, just a brief definition there. So this is a process. It's not just about the document, but the process by which an owner voluntarily confirms their willingness to allow their pet to participate in a particular study, specifically after having been informed of all aspects to the study relevant to their decision to participate. So that's a number of different things that is, you know, making sure they understand what is going to, what procedures are involved with the clinical trial, what their responsibilities are going to be, not only financially, but also as far as visits for the study and, and medications that they need to give. And, um, you know, if they need to be filling out owner diaries and things like that. And also understanding um, potential risks associated with the clinical trial, as well as potential benefits, and making sure that they've had time to to go through all of this information and, and really understand it. And um, it's important to ensure that this document is complete and has all the appropriate information. And it's a really important document, not only to the client but also to the PI and the study staff. So you know, for the client, it. it provides them with that information to ensure that they understand exactly what they're committing to. And for us as a study staff, it you know, provides an extra level of assurance that the, the, the client understands exactly what's happening with the study, um, that they feel comfortable putting you know, their pet um, into the study and going through all the procedures that are required. And so um, with regards to you know, ethical considerations and compassion fatigue and all those things that have been talked about, um, it's a really, it really helps alleviate some of that. And then with regards to the, the informed consent document itself, um, we really need resources and guidance to ensure the necessary components are included. And in human medicine, this is a lot more prevalent. There are multiple um, studies published, manuscripts published with this information. There's also guidance from the FDA um, about components and the process and things like that. And that's not quite um, quite as common in veterinary medicine. There are a few papers published. And actually, just in September of last year, um, the FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine um, released a draft guidance for the informed consent for studies that enroll client-owned companion animals. So um, we're anxiously awaiting the final document, but um, happy to report that that will soon be available and, and hopefully can be something that can be utilized by IACUCs. Um, it's also not only just the content, but also making sure to ensure the readability and comprehensibility of the informed consent. Obviously, it's a really important document, and if a client is going to sign it, we need to make sure they actually understand it. Um, and that can be easier said than done. Um, the NIH, uh, NIH actually recommends a sixth grade reading level for these documents, and um, that can be really difficult to attain when you're talking about medical procedures and, and using medical jargon. So um, 
thinking about that and then also um, keeping the informed consent updated as the study progresses. So if we're documenting adverse events that weren't necessarily expected or listed um, in the original version of the informed consent, that, that needs to be added. Or if there's changes to procedures um, and things like that, that all needs to, to go into an updated version of the informed consent. And then it's something that I think um, is not necessarily um, regulated as much or, or really um, nobody's, as far as I know, there aren't a lot of people actually regulating and watching for who is actually obtaining the informed consent and whether they're qualified. Um, so thinking about that, who is qualified or appropriate to obtain informed consent? So should a study PI be allowed to obtain consent for their uh, their own study, or could that potentially be considered coercive? And should there be some sort of training required on how to obtain um, informed consent? So we have a lot of trainings in place for other aspects related to clinical studies in IACUC, um, but for the most part, for at least at CSU, we don't have any specific training required for obtaining informed consent. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing to consider related to companion animal studies that, is that policies can't necessarily be set in stone, and there has to be a little bit of flexibility with regulations and what's considered best practices. So just a very simple example of this is if I am submitting an IACUC protocol um, with a study that requires animals to be sedated or anesthetized, our IACUC requires that I list every single possible um, medication that could be used for a sedation and anesthesia. And in client-owned animals, it's just really not feasible because every patient is going to have their own individual potential um, protocol for sedation. We can, you know, sort of have a standard one that we use, but if we have a really aggressive dog or dogs with, you know, a heart murmur or something like that, we may need to adjust that protocol. And so it can be tough um, to sort of try to, to work with a, a group that sort of has that sort of tight regulation. It also can depend a little bit on... Um, who is sponsoring our study or who the, you know, who has provided funding um, because there can be some different regulations, more stringent regulations. So if we're working with an industry sponsored clinical trial, we may have less control over changes that can be made to the study protocol and the informed consent document. And also if they're running this clinical trial at 20 different sites, they want to make sure that the protocol and the informed consent are the same at all those sites. And so while our IACUC may recommend some adjustments or ask questions, there may not be a lot that we can do to, um, to make those changes. And also same for studies where the data are going to be submitted to the FDA or NIH funded studies. Um, there's just some different um, specificities with those groups that, that really we can't make a lot of adjustments with. Next slide, please. Um, so just quickly, I wanted to touch on um, the Smart IACUC, which is um, a program that was um, instituted partially through a group called COHA, which is the CTSA One Health Alliance, which is a group of veterinary med medical academic centers um, working together with human researchers um, for clinical and translational science um, through an award through the NIH. Um, so the Smart IACUC was um, developed based on the Smart IRB that exists in um, human medicine, um, and it was developed to streamline regulatory approval in multi-site veterinary clinical studies. So basically the clinical trial or the institution that's running the clinical trial, that's originating the clinical trial, um, can include other institutions, academic institutions in the study without having to have individual review and approval by each of those separate IACUCs. And so the participating institutions will cede review to that primary institution's IACUC and or clinical review board. Um, and there's a lot of documentation and, and protocols put in place um, to guide implementation of this guidance relationship among institutions um, and, and a centralized system to support the, those different documents and approvals and things. Um, and right now, there's only um, three institutions currently participating, Ohio State, Tufts, and the University of Missouri. But the hope is to expand this and include more institutions. So this is something that's coming um, and hopefully can, and I think, you know, would be really great if we can get it implemented implemented and have it be successful. And so um, something that IACUCs need to be aware of and, and figure out a way to um, cooperate with. Um, next slide, please. I just have some resources here, um, some, you know, some documents from the AVMA policy and the draft FDA guidance that I mentioned earlier, a couple of publications about ethical review of um, veterinary clinical trials, um, an informed consent template um, that's available on the COHA website. Um, and then some documents, some papers about readability and um, 
and just documentation of informed consent, some of those from veterinary sources, some from humans. Um, and then there's actually a client consent best practices um, clinical training course, um, a link to that as well. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. And to all of uh, uh, speakers, thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, why don't I just jump into the first one that I see here? Um, and I'll elaborate a little bit. It sounds like there's a little explanation here. Okay. So the question starts off, aren't institutional EAP or employee assistance programs better suited for compassion fatigue. And uh, the question's context is asking about why this compassion fatigue topic or issue is being placed uh, on the IACUC. And there's mention also about how it's uh, the importance of it being an institutional issue. Um, I believe many of you spoke about this in your talks. If you want to uh, respond to this, uh, Sally, do you wanna start us off? Um, sure. And just making sure you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thanks. Great. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and I think, you know, we hear this a lot. Um, EAP programs are very important. They're incredibly important resources for people to get help in the support of the animals. So the challenge is that people who are supporting from an EAP perspective haven't lived through it and they can't relate. So when I speak to people, I can speak to them from, honestly, I can speak to them from the heart because I've been there and I've experienced it. And having a common shared experience with somebody makes a lot of difference in these situations. There are also boundaries. I, I do want to be clear, like, you know, we, we shouldn't be taking things to the next step. If somebody's really in crisis, we refer them to an EAP program. But if they want to talk about an incident that occurred or something that they're feeling around their care for the animals, people who have been there and who understand this community are the best people to help them with this. It's really a peer support program. Tara, um, would you like to speak on this or Patrick? Yeah, um, so sorry, I hope, I hope you can hear me too. So uh, I would say that we also make use of our EAP program. And, and as Sally said, we've had to do some extensive education to our EAP people because some of them were saying things that were a bit alienating to our staff members who would go see them, you know, because they just don't know about research animals. But beyond that, um, I think there are many components to a compassion fatigue uh, program that are outside of the scope potentially of an EAP program or that are more within our scope. You know, there's that peer support that Sally talked about. Um, I think that routine screening of people for compassion fatigue or providing routine information to people about compassion fatigue, you know, if you don't ever interact with your EAP person, you would never get that otherwise. Um, we've uh, got a lot of different activities we've engaged in with our staff and learning sessions that discuss compassion fatigue. Um, so, and, and we're just there seeing the researchers and staff members, you know, one of the common ways people learn about our program is through Sciences in the Vivarium or through, you know, me running into them and having a chat with them. So I, I just, I, EAP, I think is a good component, but I don't think it encompasses enough, I guess. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing. It, it is not, I would not say this is an IACUC responsibility. If an organization decides that's where they want the responsibility, that's up to an organization, but like at, at at University of Washington, it is not an IACUC responsibility. It is an organization responsibility that's separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's definite. Oh, Patrick, go ahead, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to indicate that one of the things we've talked about is potential. Every institution does their own kind of um, occupational health program. There may be similarities, but many do an annual health screening. And that's something that we've talked about potentially where uh, mental health or compassion fatigue could be included on that there too. You know, we focus a lot on respiratory ergonomics, but maybe actually carving out an act, um, some for mental health also, just for awareness and then to provide the resources or the directions um, from that. Great, thank you. And, you know, I think what we're seeing is the evolution of how this uh, issue that um, in my opinion, I see this, the roots of it, as you've all pointed out, in the mental health issues and the struggles and how it has come to our community because we can speak to it.
guys have talked about, but we bring back to the institution to have these broader, bigger com conversations because it is an a institutional responsibility. Um, another question um, that I had actually was uh, regarding informed consent, but also more about the uh, Smart IACUC uh, network, Kristen. Um, do you know anything about if that would allow for private practice clinics to participate more readily in vet clinical trials, or is it is that information something we'd have to reach out to them directly to talk about? Uh, thanks, Lane. That's a great question. Um, my understanding is that the Smart Eye Cook is specifically for academic institutions, but um, certainly you bring up a great point about informed consent and and review in private practices. Um, a lot of the more corporate private practices do have their own specific veterinary clinical studies um, committees that are reviewing their protocols, but there certainly are private practices out there that are doing clinical trials that don't have any sort of regulatory oversight, and that's actually something that we are um, working on with the COHA um, group, uh, we have the uh, COHA subcommittee of clinical studies that we're trying to uh, potentially institute something as sort of as a subset of the smart IACOC to help provide some sort of oversight for um, private practices that don't have something like that in place, or also to allow them to participate in studies that um, may require an OLA approval, which um, a lot of the veterinary clinical studies um, committees don't have. So things that are government funded or for FDA approval. Great. Thank you so much to all of the speakers. We really appreciate it. At this time, we're going to move on to the next session.